All right. So welcome, everybody. This is another edition of the virtual seminar of the International Please. Institute of Physics. This is another edition of the virtual seminar of the International Please. Institute of Physics. This is another edition. Of Yeah, I'm not sure what that was. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what that was. Uh, well, Delino, I can hear myself. I'm, I'm, I'm probably everyone else. Well, Delino, I can hear myself. I'm, I'm probably everyone else. Well, Delino, I can hear myself. I'm, I'm probably everyone else. Well, Delino, I can hear myself. I'm, I'm, I'm Probably everyone else. Well, Delino, I can hear myself. Probably everyone else. Well, Delino, I can hear myself. So let's see. There's a strange echo. We should we fix this. So let's see. There's a strange echo. We should fix this. So let's see. There's a strange echo. We should So let's see. There's a strange echo. Uh, we didn't have anything like that before, so I'm not sure about the if you know what, what's uh, going on. We didn't have anything like that before, so I'm not sure about the if you know what, what's uh, going we on. Didn't have anything like that before, so I'm not sure about the if you know what's going on. Well, Delina, try to say something. I'll just see if it's my problem or maybe. Well, Delina, try to say something. I'll just see if it's my problem. Okay, yeah, it seems like, well, at least only my voice was repeated. Okay, yeah, it seems like, well, so, only Thiago, maybe you can, so, Thiago, maybe you can. Are you with uh, YouTube also on, Dimitri? Maybe it's repeating from YouTube. Yes, in fact, I was, and, but it never happened before. So I think now it's okay, right? Yes, 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 it's okay. Yeah, okay, okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for for this for this problem. Uh, so I think now we can start. And again, welcome everybody to the virtual seminar of the International Institute of Physics. And uh, I'm very happy to introduce Alejandro Castro, who is our speaker today. Uh, Alejandro has connections with South American continents. She started her career in Chile in the Pontifical. Catholic University of, of Chile and where she graduated from. And she continued uh, doing her PhD in, in the United States in the University of Michigan. After finish, finishing her PhD, she did two postdocs, one in McGill University and the other one at Harvard. And since 2013, she is a professor at Amsterdam, uh, University of Amsterdam. Uh, so her interest her field of interest is uh, classical and quantum gravity, in particular black holes and cosmology. And she's very well known for her works on application of the holographic or ADS-CFT correspondence, standing of the uh, quantum gravity and structure of space-time. And today she will talk about her perspective on this. Uh, so without further ado, I pass the word to you, Alejandro. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and giving this talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Okay, so I'll share my screen uh, with you guys. 
I'll just make sure that everybody can see properly. I hope so. Yes, you we can see, see my pointer. Okay. Yes. So let's get started. Um, very good. So today I want to give you a perspective on gravity, uh, on gravitational theories um, from, a, from a theoretical perspective. Uh, but also nowadays in, in the era that we live, I find it very useful to take also a perspective that the way that we're thinking about gravity and, and how to advance the, the, the field and the subject in a theoretical point of view, uh, it's, it's actually very useful to put it in, in, in the context and an analogy with engineering. So there's a, there's a sense in which uh, th this comes about because of my excitement and how I think the field is going to progress and how we're going to go forward. And, and, and there's a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of collaborations and different synergies. Uh, so to make this, um, oh, sorry, uh, to make this, uh, this analogy sharper and, and more precise, uh, let's imagine uh, as an engineer um, that what we want to do is build a, a very modern infrastructure, let's say a skyscraper, okay? So uh, as an engineer, you have to come up with an original design and find uh, creative solutions uh, to that design so that you can build the building. So the basic things that as an engineer uses very schematically, you will need blueprints, uh, you will need materials, you will need tools to, to get uh, to your final goal, which is the, the building, the, the skyscraper. Now, from a theoretical physics point of view, uh, I think uh, all of these concepts as well have a home and, and have a, an, an analogy as well. So in the context of uh, how I'm going to be presenting the colloquium today, for me, the blueprints are the principles and laws that come about, okay? So are the, the cores of, of how we think in terms of physics and, and what is it, what are we allowed to do given, given these principles and laws? Uh, the materials will come about as particles and its interactions. And because I'm going to be talking about gravity, we are also going to see geometry as a, as a material and as an interesting material that gives us different facets. And finally, uh, the tools are it's basically where comes our creativity as a theorist. And so how do we make use of mathematics? How do we make use of symmetries? And how do we kind of implement and tie things together? Uh, so it's a little bit more abstract from that point of view, but it's basically in that context that how we, we kind of um, are clever in that context. So with this analogies, my whole presentation will be contaminated by, by these little cartoons and, and, and how they fit. And so with this, I'm going to divide, uh, this, this talk is going to be divided into three sections. Um, I hope I, I managed to go through all of them. Uh, sometimes I tend to run out of time, but it will be, I think it will still be okay. So the first thing that I'll, I'll do is basically give you a big panorama about what am I, in, in which context, what am I trying to build and, and what are the big uh, open questions and then a bit the, 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 the path that we're going to take uh, in, in this area. Uh, and then we'll dive into understanding a bit better what are these principles, what are the laws and how we're trying to solve all things by looking at the principle and, and black holes. And finally, uh, it's where I get very excited is trying to implement all of these ideas. Okay, so how can we come up with interesting materials, with novel materials, and with new creative solutions in order to, to get to our objectives and have a view holography as, as, uh, from that perspective, okay, on something that we can actually uh, play around and have uh, different things to do, and, and, and there's a path forward to our grand building, uh, which will be basically quantum gravity, okay? Very good. So uh, this theory is about uh, gravitational physics. And so let's first explore basically what, what is our current understanding of gravitational physics in a very kind of like this will be in a very broad sort of uh, conceptual way. Uh, and just to start, set the stage uh, as a starter, uh, gravity nowadays, uh, it's thought in the context of general relativity, okay? So the, the bottom line uh, of our, our understanding of gravitational physics is that uh, according to Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity is that gravity is geometry, 
Okay. Uh, this comes up with beautiful theoretical predictions related to gravitational waves, the orbital motion of both planets, uh, the bending of light, uh, all of things that have been uh, tested with great precision uh, nowadays. Now, one thing that is remarkable about these equations and that I'll dive into more details as we get to black holes is that um, these are things, the, all of these phenomena that I'm presenting here are not things that one has to imagine as a theorist or they're not esoteric things. And in particular in the context of black holes, uh, each of these uh, phenomena actually are things that have a measurement associated. So I will be talking about them in a theoretical point of view. Uh, but what, one thing that is very interesting and exciting is that there's also an observational counterpart to these different types uh, of um, uh, features of general relativity. So we have measured gravitational waves, uh, the orbital motion of, of stars, for instance, around a black hole was instrumental for the Nobel Prize of 2020. This one was the Nobel Prize of 2017. Uh, this one will come any day, but this is the event horizon, the imaging of, of black holes, which is basically uh, understanding the motion of, of light. So very good. So. With that in mind, uh, the, there's a lot of opportunities of, uh, as well in an observational realm and as well as a theoretical realm. Now, now let me focus on the theoretical perspective. So what I have in mind is the following. So I, I love presenting this picture because it, it shows a bit about how we think about physics at different stages and, and the intricacies. And sometimes it looks simple, sometimes it will look more complicated. Um, and there will be different casts. So basically we started down here, we're going to start down here with our robust understanding of gravity in terms of uh, general relativity. But what I have in mind is that uh, we want to build a path uh, upwards where I get to the round of quantum gravity, where, which, by which I mean that I could have a unified and consistent uh, description of what quantum mechanics and general relativity is. Now, uh, so in, in the bottom here, sorry, um, in the bottom here, we have these beautiful pictures that I illustrated to you before about the predictions that general relativity uh, comes about. And in quantum gravity, uh, from my perspective, what I mean is basically uh, string theory as a theory that describes uh, the quant uh, gravity uh, consistently with other interactions that matter. But there's many things that we don't know about it, but in some sense, what I'm trying to aim is I'm making uh, clear what is the connection uh, between these two paths. And going from the bottom to the top is quite challenging. So we can say these words, but the, the point is that we need to understand how do you go about uh, that path and there's different detours that you can take. And in this uh, talk, what I'll do is that uh, I'll basically take this following route. So the first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to look at uh, the physics uh, of black holes, which is our first step in towards understanding how the quantum meets the classical. And, and this will make us um, beautifully progress to the holographic principle. Uh, and, and along the way, uh, a, a tool that will be very important is lower dimensional model. So let me tell you a little bit more about each of these three uh, steps that I'm going to be taking. So. This first one, the black hole route, uh, well, the, the black hole step. Uh, here, what will be key is basically the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy formula. This is one of my favorite formulas. Well, we'll I'll write it again in a few slides, but I, if I can write it twice, I will write it twice. And if I can write it three times, I will write it three times. It's a fantastic formula that basically tells us that black holes carry entropy that is controlled by its area. And most importantly, uh, uh, the three fundamental constants of physics uh, enter in this uh, equation. Now, this is uh, basically our precursor to the holographic principle because the, the remarkable fact that here the area enters, it was one of the great motivations and, 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 and justifications to understanding gravity from a holographic point of view. It's the fact that the areas enter in this formula and not the volumes, which tells us something about the degrees of freedom uh, and quantum gravity. Now, um, 
So th th these will be two important uh, things, but that's not quite enough for what I'm going to say today. It's also important, uh, the fact that I'm going to be using low dimensional models uh, and basically to have precision and control on what I do. And one thing that I want to highlight at this stage is that despite the fact that I might be in low dimensions when I get towards the end of this uh, colloquium, I do want to highlight that there's quite a lot of value and interest in, in these models and they do say things and they, they, they challenge how we think about gravity even in four dimensions. So in low dimensional models, you're very forced to think about gauge symmetries, uh, which leads to the concept of asymptotic symmetries. And, and this nowadays has had a really big impact on the role of scattering amplitudes and, and gravity. So, so just keep that in mind uh, that uh, this perhaps might see like putting myself in a corner, but and but in and and what we have learned in, in the past uh, decades is that um, it also gives us novel ways how to think about gravity in, in higher dimension and, and extend uh, those lessons. Very good. So now uh, with these uh, concepts in mind, uh, there will be quite of interconnections between them. So what we're going to see here, so these two bottom things are going to tell us a lot about what are principles and laws that we're trying to build. And as I use lower dimensional models to say things about black holes or things about the holographic principle, there will be various concepts that come in uh, secretly or explicitly. Uh, and these are concepts that I'm basically using as basically my materials and, and tools. And the end goal uh, that, okay, I, I'm not going to claim victory in this talk, but you can see it as my aspiration for the future of what I'm trying to do here is basically that one day we'll be able to build this fantastic infrastructure, which will be the theory of uh, quantum gravity. So this is my panorama, okay? This is how this talk is going to look like to you and, 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 and how am I thinking about uh, quantum gravity with all these pieces and puzzles. So I hope we're ready for the second part of this talk. Yes, we are. Okay, very good. So let's move to the second part. So let's talk about uh, black holes and, and, and this holographic um, uh, principle. Very good. So what, what are basic, basic things that we're trying to reproduce, understand, and, and things that we feel that are fundamental in our knowledge of gravitational physics in this theoretical realm? Okay. So uh, as we stated before, we have this beautiful uh, description of general relativity uh, where gravity uh, is uh, geometry, okay? And one of like the basic, uh, out of these equations, uh, one of the most beautiful solutions that comes out uh, is basically a black hole. So in, in, in this context, so when we have gravity, we know that the amount of mass that we have determines basically the shape of space uh, time. And a black hole is a situation where the curvature is so extreme, it's so immense that at base nothing uh, can escape. And not even uh, light uh, can escape. So usually uh, for those of you that uh, are not experts in, in this field, uh, a very useful way how to think about uh, a black hole is it's in a very similar analogy as a, as a waterfall. So if you're out in this region sailing around, you'll be fine. But if you decide to cross this edge, which is basically here schematically it will be like the horizon of the black hole. Um, if, you're, if you cross that edge, then you won't be able to go back. Okay, the same way as in a waterfall, uh, if you pass some edge, then Good luck. Uh, and unfortunately, this is a very violent water hopeful because when you hit, hit the bottom, you'll probably be gone forever. So I do not recommend crossing the edge, but we can stay outside here and study what happens outside there, okay? Very good. So I, I was telling you that we're going to take uh, black holes from a theoretical point of view. Okay, um, and we're going to study various properties of them. And, and from a theoretical point of view, uh, there's various aspects of black holes that are, are quite simple, and we're going to use them in, in what follows. So I told you about this edge here uh, that we call uh, basically the event horizon. It's something that tells us about the size of the black hole. All of the mass is concentrated in the middle, 
it's a highly, highly dense object, but when we say what is the size of a black hole, we're basically indicating what is basically the size of that edge of the region for which you can't escape. And that is determined by how much mass it's, it's inside of, of it, okay? So what is the amount of mass inside of this? And this will be an important concept uh, in what comes along. <laughs> so in, there's a sense in which uh, there's an intuitive, um, if, if you think about a black hole as an object that carries mass, uh, there's an in intuitive reason why uh, a black hole will carry information. It's a massive object. It, it, it's, it's made out of something. So in that sense, it has information. And, and one of the questions that, uh, for instance, Hawking and various other people, uh, Beckenstein, Cartin, uh, sorry, Bardeen, Carter, uh, were thinking about in, in the 70s was, okay, so there's a sense in which black holes are have some information inside of them, but how much? How can we quantify how much information a black hole carries? Uh, and this question is basically the first uh, step into trying to reconcile uh, general relativity uh, with uh, quantum mechanics. The outcome of this uh, computation um, is as follows. So I, I won't go through the derivation, but one of the beautiful results uh, from the 70s was that yes, black holes can carry entropy, okay? Uh, they carry information. They tell us something uh, about uh, how many microstates they have. And they furthermore obey a law of thermodynamics. Now, what is, uh, so, so in this equation here, here I'm writing down what is the entropy of the black hole as a function of the area of this horizon, okay, as I wrote before. And, and this is the first law that I'm advocating for. So if you change uh, the mass of the black hole, the change of the mass is going to be equal to a change on this entropy that I defined here times uh, what we call the Hawking temperature. And this Hawking temperature is basically the acceleration that you feel uh, when you're very close uh, to the horizon. Okay, so that's, um, sorry, that's this variable here, the Hawking temperature. Very good. But what is, what's interesting uh, about this formula besides this? So this is quite uh, remarkable. Black holes are, are thermodynamics, uh, are thermodynamical objects. It came uh, somewhat for free. But what's very interesting as well here is that this formula doesn't depend on the volume of the black hole. It depends on the area of the black hole. So naively, you might have thought that if you were trying to understand the black hole as, as, as an object that carries information and that and in the process of changing its mass, you might have thought, ah, if I throw more mass into the black hole, it should have changed like the volume of the object. And what's quite surprising is that no, it doesn't change as its volume, as is typical in thermodynamic systems, as like particles inside of a box, is that when you throw more mass into the black hole, what changes, what responds is the area of the black hole. Okay, this, this will be very much key in, in what uh, follows. The other thing that is beautiful about this formula and why I keep on writing it, oh, sorry, uh, is the fact um, uh, that all these constants here, all these fundamental constants appear in, in, in this equation. So we have the speed of light, we have G Newton, and, and we have H bar which basically are telling us that if we wanted to understand uh, this formula quite deeply, we can just be in the realm of general relativity where we study objects that are, move at very high speeds and are very massive, but we also have to include uh, objects that can potentially be very small. And that's why it's nice to draw this cube to illustrate that here, what do I mean by quantum gravity is something where you have to have a good understanding of general relativity and how to make it compatible with something like uh, quantum field theory, okay? So that's what, uh, what also, it's quite uh, fantastic about this equation here. And the questions that we have, so once you, once you have this, the obvious questions, once uh, these guys in the 70s said, oh, black holes actually there's if you if you throw mass to a black hole if you make it the mass of a black hole increase we're noticing that the same the loss of thermodynamics are, are are applying the basic question is like okay that sounds great 
But what are these molecules that we're counting? What is the entropy? So it can't be the standard answer because the standard answer will have told you that these quantities were growing like the volume and, and all these fundamental constants will not have appeared uh, in this way. So what is the, the quantity that, 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 uh, that you're counting? What is the microscopic, the statistical interpretation of this? And this is where a theory of quantum gravity should be able to provide answers, okay? And in that context, uh, string theory has been uh, the most successful way how to understand this. And in particular, uh, and this is, will take me uh, right away to, based on this formula on how to think gravity in terms of a holographic uh, principle. So in um, nowadays, in trying to account for this formula and, and explain various things, um, we, we will use the concept uh, of holography. And uh, if you're new to this concept, if you haven't encountered it before, uh, the best way how to think about holography is in terms of a can of soup. I love thinking about holography as a can of soup because it really illustrates conceptually roughly what are we trying to, to do. Uh, and the analogy is as follows. So uh, when you go to the store and buy soup, uh, you go, you grab a can, so the soup is inside of the can, and to determine what type of soup you're buying, so what's inside of the can, uh, I suspect that most of you do not open the can in the store and drink it to taste it, right? That's kind of, if you do that, stop doing it because it's not okay. Uh, but th that's not how you determine what type of soup you're going to, to get. What you do is that you read the label. And if you read the label, the label completely determines what's inside of the soup uh, with high fidelity. So, so this is how we're going to try to think about it, of gravity. We're going to try to think of gravity as being the soup in the middle, and there's going to be a counterpart theory that lives on the boundary, and that boundary is the label, which tells us everything that is inside of the soup, okay? So that, that's what, I, when I use the term, the jargon holography, this is exactly what I have in mind, okay? So it's more formally, it's a system for which uh, the boundary basically determines everything about the interior. So there's an equivalence between two systems uh, of different uh, dimensionality. Very good. So more uh, carefully, so the, the concept that came about uh, in string theory is that a gravitational theory uh, in D dimensions, the proposal is that a gravitational theory in D dimensions is equivalent to a quantum field theory that does not have gravity in D minus one dimensions. And the pictures that we usually draw uh, are, are of, this, of, of this form. So we draw the can of soup. That's a quite nice way how to view uh, a holography. Or we also sometimes um, draw this as a surface and then gravity is in, in the middle. Now, I should be clear, the only bad thing about these drawings, what is a little bit misleading, is that the label is, is not necessarily at a finite position of space-time. You can still have infinite volume in these in this gravitational systems, and you're just projecting it to, to something that lives in one dimension lower. But the drawings, I'm forced to put the, the, the surface, the boundary at, at some given location. So just so you know, it doesn't mean that I, I put gravity on a, on a, on a finite volume, uh, but, but it, I'm trying to illustrate that there's a theory that lives in D dimensions and it's equivalent to an, a completely, seemingly completely different theory in D minus one uh, dimensions. So that's the basic idea. Okay, okay. and now uh, for people that work in this field, uh, if you want to spot one of us uh, walking down the street, let's say, um, this is our, I, I'm, not, I'm going to try to not use this jargon, but this is another piece of jargon that we use. If you hear a physicist talking about the bulk and the boundary theory, you know that it's someone that works on however. This is the best way how to detect them. Uh, so we call usually the gravitational theory, the bulk theory, and the quantum field theory, uh, that is the label, the boundary theory. And so this is how you spot us. <coughs> Very good. So now uh, let's with this um, tell you a little bit more about what has been done uh, in this area of, hol of holography. So this, this is a, as a proposal was basically like the evidence, the reason why I'm telling you about this uh, and the framework that told us like how this works uh, was provided by string theory, 
Okay, so this made this proposal not just a fantasy or something intuitive that came from black holes only, but within the framework of, uh, of, of string theory, this was uh, firmly proposed. And one aspect of this map that is important to highlight is that it relates as well couplings. And, and this will come in a lot uh, as we dive more into the details of holography. So for instance, if your theory of gravity here, it's a weakly coupled theory of gravity. So that's what will be general relativity uh, with matter. So it's a theory that doesn't have, uh, for instance, uh, quantum effects turn on, it's a classical theory. Then what you map to it at the edge is a quantum field theory uh, that has uh, strong interactions. This is a version of conservation of difficulty in physics, because nothing comes for free in life. So this, this drawing basically tells me that when I understand very well this side, then strongly interacting systems tend to be more complicated. And I suffer more from that other point of view. But okay. And the reverse is also true. So you can have also here in the middle, put something very, very, very quantum, uh, like let's say uh, a, a string theory that is a very quantum regime, for instance, like something where the strings are very floppy, like a tensionless limit of, of string theory. So you can do that here. And then it simplifies the theory at the boundary. So then the theory at the boundary here, it's a weakly coupled quantum field theory that usually you understand uh, pretty, pretty well. Uh, but then, okay, then you have to understand uh, string theory in this opposite regime very, very well, well as well. So it it, there's always balance in life, okay? Nothing comes for free. But in any case, it, it gives us this interesting uh, correspondence between the two. So, but this is the case that we're mostly going to be interested in. This is what um, part of under, our understanding of what quantum gravity is will be uh, really advocated to this case where I have the strong interactions plus the matter. Now, a bit more about the, the map. Uh, so in, in, in string theory, these cases that we understand well and that we have a lot of evidence are cases where on the gravitational side is not quite any theory of gravity, but it's a theory of gravity where you have a negative cosmological constant. Uh, this is what we call ADS. And, and the theory at the boundary uh, what is this is uh, dual to or equivalent to? It's a, a, a special class of quantum field theories, which are go under the name of conformal field theories. So these are systems that are basically invariant under uh, dilations. Now, so and this basically then when I draw these cartoons, uh, this is what we call ADS uh, CFT. Okay, very good. So in that context, uh, and, and, and I will focus for the rest of this colloquium on this instance uh, of, the, of the correspondence, what I want you to, to keep in mind is that it gives me, it's a duality in the sense that it gives me a map. So it tells me basically how to relate quantities here in the middle uh, to quantities here in the, in the boundary. Uh, and, and it maps everything. So it maps couplings and it maps uh, operators, it will map states, it will map, map distances. So there's, a, there's an understanding of how things go in both ways. But most importantly, uh, how I'll, I'll be using it and what comes along and, and what has been uh, very fruitful in my engineering perspective is that what we'll do for, for when we get to the third part of the talk is that it gives me and now, in a way, a definition of what quantum gravity could be. Because basically, this, this theory at the boundary could predict, uh, could define for me what does it mean to have a uh, theory of quantum gravity here in the middle. Now, to start uh, wrapping up uh, this, this section on holography, I should say that this is a duality, as, as a relationship between apparently two very differently, seemingly different. Uh, Theories. So here you have gra gravity with a negative cosmological constant, and here you have a conformal field theory. You might have thought these things had nothing to do with each other. They're completely different dimensions. Uh, but one of the power and the successes of our field has been to connect them with, with this correspondence. Then you see 
how you can open thousands of opportunities on exploring completely different areas of theoretical physics by starting from uh, understanding gravitational physics, which is really like, I find it very impressive and inspirational and it tells us how in theoretical physics is not just about specialization in one area, but there's opportunities of connecting with many different branches uh, along the way. So here I listed just some examples that I find uh, compelling, uh, but there's many, 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 many more. Um, and so just to highlight some, there's a relationship in the context of ADS-CFT, how can you understand something like quark gluon plasma, understanding high TC superconductors, uh, the theory of fluid dynamics, of hydrodynamics has uh, benefited quite a bit from the holographic cor correspondence, understanding also non-relativistic systems. So you can also explore systems of strong couplings that perhaps you didn't have access before um, from a quantum field theory point of view. And in the past, like let's say 20 years or maybe 15, depending on how you count, uh, it's also been quite fascinating how to also connect gravitational physics, this theoretical run with areas such as uh, quantum information. So this has been quite fruitful uh, as well in both directions in understanding what quantum gravity is and also uh, noticing new things uh, and from the quantum information perspective. But very good. Uh, and to conclude this part of the talk, I did want to leave you because I, I'll dive into something more specific. Um, but I wanted to uh, give you three roughly open questions that we have in this field about how we like, they're not all of the open questions, they're just like the ones that I find kind of cool. So, um, and since I'm talking, then these are the ones that I'll, I'll mention. Um, but three questions that are, that are interesting, for instance, the first uh, one of them uh, is, and this one has received a lot of attention in the past uh, five years or so. Well, it has always been pressing, but there has been quite uh, beautiful progress in the past five years is, uh, for instance, what does it mean to dive into a black hole? So how do you understand quantum properties uh, of a black hole? This is a highly non-trivial question because as I told you uh, some moments ago, if you dive into a black hole, at least our current understanding is that you will disappear, which is sad, but also more than sad, so we will miss you. But um, more importantly, what's problematic about that is that it's not clear what would be that process from the point of view of this duality and what the theory of the boundary is. So this is something that we're trying to understand and resolve on like, what would that journey look like if you get into a rocket and start, like, would you be able to move books in your daughter's bookshelf? I don't know, I don't think so. But if you've seen the movie, then you got the joke. If you haven't seen the movie, then. I just said a really, a, a, a combination of sentences that made no sense, but okay. You can ask me which movie I was referring to if you haven't seen the movie. Very good. Now, uh, the other uh, question, which is quite interesting. So I was advocating here a lot for this instances. I, 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 I introduced you to this concept of ADS-CFT that came about uh, in string theory, but of course, uh, not all theories of gravity have a negative cosmological constant or are defined in a space that has negative curvature. Uh, our universe, we have positive curvature, or you might think that you might wanna apply this to cases that are Minkowski. And, and this is an important area of work. So how, what is the form of the correspondence? What are the tools, the dictionaries? Um, what is, uh, how can we understand gravity in, in other situations? So there has been made progress it is that so far the, the places that we feel more comfortable and confident about the correspondence are these ones that fall under the realm of ADS-CFT. Uh, but uh, the, the big idea is to do this in more, in more cases. And finally, and this will be the focus of the last part uh, of the colloquium, uh, is to take this correspondence seriously and say, if I have a quantum theory at the boundary, what do I need to do to it? So what are the materials and the tools that I need such that the outcome is just general relativity? Uh, and this is also as, quite, as well quite challenging. And many explicit examples that we have in string theory, the outcome here is not just pure general relativity. It tends to be 
uh, matter, um, is, sorry, it tends to be general relativity coupled to other degrees of freedom. And so we still don't have very good control on what are, what are the things that we should specify here in order for us to get like what you might consider like the most minimalistic uh, version of gravity. Very good. So that concludes uh, the second part of this talk and I'm going really well on time. So I'm very proud of myself. So let's go through the third part uh, and let's talk about um, putting into use uh, this holographic uh, principle, okay? And it will be in the context of ADS uh, CFT. So we have this question. Uh, this is the, la the, the very last question uh, that we had. And uh, I want to do I, I want to do this, and I'll do it in the context of ADS CFT because even even in in this uh, in this version of holography, uh, this is an interesting question, and it basically uh, will tell us even in in, in in cases where we have negative uh, curvature, it will tell us um, about how space time emerges in in those situations. So. Very good, so we're going to do that. And so let's understand a little bit what is the state of the art. So we do have examples that are very concrete. Um, and then there's many, many instances in string theory, but there's very few examples where we can really explore this duality at different regimes. So I was referring to you that, oh, you can put the, the quantum theory at strong coupling or at weak coupling. And that gives you, also it changes the couplings from the gravitational theory. So, so we can tamper with the couplings on this side and, and we know from some explicit examples that it tampers with the couplings on this, on this other side. But uh, the control, in order for us to prove this correspondence and say, yes, this is all established and done, is that we, we, it, we're not really good at exploring, like having systems of strong couplings are, are difficult. And so, it's, it's one of the things that we're working on and trying to understand better the correspondence and understand the fundamental mechanism, mechanism by doing these type of examples. So here I listed my three favorite examples that kind of highlight like, okay, these are cases that are, are best understood. And, and they're actually, they're ordered by number of dimensions, but they're also ordered by amount of understanding. <laughs> so coincidentally. So the best studied case and then the one that we actually have the most control in terms of these different regimes of the couplings is the case of ADS5 CFT4, where we, uh, um, the statement is that type 2B string theory on ADS5 times S5 is dual to n equal four superior middle and four dimensions. Okay, so that, that's the case where the most amount of evidence and, and different regimes of the theory have been done. And, 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 I, and as a member of this community, you can feel very proud about all the beautiful results there. The next case, it's a little bit, it's also a lot of things have been understood and said, uh, but there, of course, there's a little bit less knowledge. And then uh, amazingly, the case of ADS3 CFT2, which I'll start focusing on in a moment. Um, it's a case that we know, we know a lot, but we also have the less control on this, uh, on these different regimes on, on how do you tamper with uh, the couplings. But okay, so with that, uh, if you really want to say this is the way to understand gravity and we want to prove, let's say, uh, ADS CFT and, 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 and say this is an established understanding of quantum gravity, it's not just a proposal or a conjecture, uh, we need more than a few examples, okay? So it's, it's not enough to just uh, state a few of them and then uh, think that it works. So the, the way, the strategy that I take and saying, okay, how, how, how am I going to overcome this? Uh, there's two ways, two questions, two possible questions that I've, I've asked and, and tried to, to get uh, to overcome these difficulties. So one question is, okay, uh, if we claim that we are, this is the way how to think gravity, in some sense, if I give you a CFT, then one should be capable of saying, how do you organize the information of that CFT, so I'll give you this. And then you should tell me, ah, this is the theory of gravity that you get as an outcome. And these are all, anything that you wanted to ask about the theory of gravity will be 
given by this dictionary, right? That will be the dream. That will be a fantastic dream. But it's a question then, then we have. And the other one, uh, connecting to, to the answer of uh, the question of general relativity, you can also ask, okay, let's say that as an engineer, you really want here to have at least part of the theory being described by general relativity. So you want a classical geometrical theory uh, in ADS, what do you need to impose on the CFT? Okay, so what classes of CFTs, what, what is the family of CFTs for which the gravitational sector here is going to be given by general relativity? Okay, it's a different question than, than this one. They're, they are interconnected, uh, but that, that's another type of question that you can, you can ask, okay? So uh, let's see how can we make progress on that. So I'll show it to you uh, what are progress that has been done in answering these two questions in the context of ADS3 CFT2, okay? Uh, I will be using a lot of symmetries that are very specific to, to this instance of holography, but I hope it will illustrate how do you think about the problem and what are the challenges in trying to uh, answer those questions, okay? So let's start with the first question. So uh, let's say that you hand me a CFT2 and, 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 and I have to tell you, how do you organize that as a theory of quantum gravity? So two fantastic CFT2s that I think are wonderful uh, are the Ising model and the tricritical tri Ising model. So these are basically, the Ising model is basically a system of spins and, and the system of spin has a critical point for which it becomes a, a CFT, the tricritical icing model as well. Um, and in the language of, of, of CFTs in two, in two dimensions, uh, they fall under the classification of the Verasoro minimal model. So this is a CFT with central charge equal to one half. And this at the critical point of the tricritical icing model, it will be a CFT with central charge seven over 10. Okay, uh, and the object that we're going to study in, this, uh, in the following, we're going to look at the partition function of, of the CFT. So I'm just, I'm going to look at this quantity that basically will count states uh, in these two theories. And, and this is the formula by which it counts states. And, and the question will be basically, can I write down that partition function that counts states in the conformal field theory as an object uh, that can look like a, a gravitational path entry, okay? So is this possible? Now, when I write down gravitational path integral, so the C gravity, uh, what it means uh, is basically it's viewed as a sum over all possible geometries. And here at the CFT, when it's put at finite temperature and you define the partition function, you're counting, uh, you're basically defining the topology of a torus. And so what I'm thinking in this context of gravity is that I need to sum over all geometries that have uh, the topology uh, at the boundary of a torus. So they're basically going to be a solid torus. So from, from the point of view of my can of soup, uh, what I'm doing is making time periodic. So time went up in the can of soup and, and I'm identifying time, okay? And then there will be contributions to this path integral coming uh, from uh, thermal ADS and, and uh, the BT set uh, black hole. Now, what I want to, like, in, in constructing the sum, we're going to think that we only have gravitational degrees of freedom. And so then basically the geometries that can contribute uh, to, to the sum are literally thermal ADS, which you can view it as basically the ground state of the system. And then uh, there will be a whole family. There will be many, many, many other contributions to this path integral that will look more like uh, a black hole uh, type contributions. Uh, but they're countable and, and you can uh, basically uh, do this sum. So, um, and in doing that sum, this, this, this path integral, so if, if these are the geometries uh, that you have in mind, this gravitational path integral will basically look uh, like this, okay? So it, it, this is a succinct way of how to describe uh, all of the contributions that come from the path integral in, in quantum gravity, uh, if you only think that your contributions are these uh, geometries. 
But what is the answer to my question? So are these two things related? And the answer to the icing or the tricritical icing. And the answer is yes, meaning that the CFT partition function that was organized as a sum of all states in the icing and the tricritical icing model, you can recast it such that it looks in this way where you would have said, ah, that would have been the same way that I would have organized a gravitational uh, path integral. So that's quite nice. So I basically gave the icing and the tricritical icing model a gravitational interpretation because they're partition functions, which are usually organized as a sum over energy uh, states over its conformal dimensions. You can uh, rearrange the sums in a way that it, it has this form, which has a gravitational uh, interpretation. Now, what I'm not telling you here, um, some important remarks now I'm telling you, so I will tell you. Um, the, the, well, it's really nice news that this happened, uh, but the bad news is that the two minimal models that I presented to you is that they're the only ones that admit this very specific form. If you grab a different uh, Verasoro minimal model, um, you will have problems if you insist that it has exactly uh, this form. Uh, you will, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a gravitational counterpart, but it's much more difficult for us to identify what the gravitational counterpart is. So for these two examples, we can uh, clearly identify the gravitational counterpart by looking just at the partition function. The gravitational here, theory here is very quantum, so we really don't have access to classical properties of ADS, and this is because the central charge of these theories is very small. I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Um, and so far, based on some um, results in the literature, one way to over, if you insist on this form, so if you insist this, I just want gravitational theories for which its path integral looks exactly like this. Um, so if you're stubborn about that as a starting point, then it seems like averaging over conformal field theories is the, is the only path forward. But this is still work in progress, so it's, it's not, um, there's quite a lot of debate of if that's the interpretation or not. But very good. So that was one part of the exercise of like, okay, so if I can use a CFT, how do you organize it as a theory of quantum graph? Now let's look at the second question that I asked. Okay, so um, the second question was, which conformal field theories can capture uh, classical geometrical properties of gravity? And this is something that we've been working on um, and more recently uh, with a long set uh, of collaborators. So here, what we want from, from a gravity point of view, so in the previous examples, things were very quantum. But here I want to get to classical gravity. And so by classical gravity, I mean that uh, the gravitational sector is described by the Einstein helper term plus matter. So this at low energies uh, in the classical realm, this is the reliable way how to describe uh, gravity. And this theory has a lot of universal parts of the of its spectrum. Uh, so if you look at the solutions of this theory, uh, you will always have like these BTZ black holes that we were talking about. You will have perturbative states that are coming from the gravitational realm and then also perturbative states that are coming from the matter part. And then depending on the comfort, on the theories that you have, you might have other configurations as well. So this is where it might be that the path integrals don't organize perfectly as I was describing before, uh, but it will not be important for what I'll tell you today. What is very important <coughs> as we ask the second question is that when I write this action and I say, this is gravity, uh, I'm in a certain regime for which this is uh, a good description. And basically I want one over G Newton to be very big so that my two derivative action is the most important contribution that I have. Now, the radius of ADS, so this is what dictates the radius of curvature, the negative curvature that I have in my space time. Uh, another way how to phrase this is that the, rate, the ADS radius in Planck units has to always be very, very, very big. And in the context of ADS 3 CFT2, this ratio is related to the central charge of the conformal field theory. 
So that's why the examples that I was presenting before, this ratio has to be very, very big in order for me to trust these equations. And, and that's why the Ising model and the tricritical tri Ising model were very quantum uh, because they don't have very large values of their central charges, okay? So this is going to be quite important. So let me say it in a, again in a slightly different way. Uh, when, I, when I want my theory to have a classical geometrical description, it means that at low energies, I want them to be uh, described by a local effective field theory. This is a local effective field theory. I will receive corrections, but at very low energies, this is a good description. And then if I start going up in, in, in energy scales, then we'll add corrections to that, okay? So very good. So, uh, so I want to basically construct CFTs that could connect to theories that are of this form. So you go to the land of CFTs, and so you say, imagine for a moment, for a brief moment, that we know all conformal field theories in two dimensions, okay? So we don't, we don't know all conformal field theories in two dimensions, but imagine for a moment that you did, that this universe of, of theories was known to you. So basically what I'm trying to do here, if I, if I knew all conformal field theories in two dimensions, what I'm trying to do is trying to specify which of those conformal field theories will be what I call uh, holographic, okay? So that, that the, the gravitational theory in an inappropriate regime can be described in terms of the Einstein-Hilbert action. The icing model and the trick critical icing model will fall into, into this part, not into the orange part, okay? Or reddish uh, part of the, of the picture. So what I want here, is basically I want uh, to look at CFTs that at least will meet uh, two requirements. The first requirement is the one that I stated that I wanted the central charge uh, to be very, very, very big. And the second requirement is the sparseness, where we call sparseness on, on the spectrum, which puts a restriction on the how many primary operators they have. And it comes motivated by this drawing that I was showing to you before of like how basically states organize in a gravitational theory. So if you only have gravity, you have what we call uh, this uh, ADS as the ground state. And then you have, there's a big gap in energies. And then you have the BTZ black hole. Now I will allow gravity to be coupled to matter. So you might have a few other states, but you want very few of them. Uh, because you don't want the number of matter fields to be of uh, over overcome the Planck length, okay, to, to overcome G Newton. So the number of fields that you have, the, you don't want it to grow with uh, the, the Planck constant. Uh, sorry, the Planck length. Okay, so this is what we call a sparseness condition. So you can have more states here, so it doesn't have to look exactly like pure gravity, but you don't want many of them so that you can have a local effective uh, field theory. So in that endeavor, uh, since we don't know the green region very well, uh, with my collaborators, we said, okay, we have to make some compromises. And so we started, decided to study as collaborators. We said, okay, we have to make some compromises. And so we started, decided to study a space of CFTs that we do have control over. And these are the uh, these classes of CFTs that we do have control over. Their space are called their symmet sorry their supersymmetric conformal field theories uh, that are described by a symmetric product or their symmet sorry their supersymmetric conformal field theories uh, that are described by a symmetric product orbital. And I will try to never say all those words all together because as you can tell, I choke even <laughs> trying to like give you all the adjectives that come up among these theories. But okay, so what are these theories? Uh, very briefly, these theories, uh, there's a lot of, uh, they're very beautiful um, and they give us a, a lot of control and they're, 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 there's a simple way how to think about them. They're basically stacks of theories. So imagine that you have, a, um, and they give us a, a lot of control and they're, 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 there's a simple way how to think about uh, that you know very well and then you, you repeat it a bunch of times. So you do the tensor product of that theory. Uh, that's, and, and then um, you tensor it, but then you also say, ah, the permutations of the copies are all equivalent. So it doesn't matter in which order you're, you're tensoring the theory. And, and that's what symmetric product orbifold means. It means that you're tensoring a theory and then identifying by the permutation group because the positions of the copies 
don't matter. So that's what this big mouthful uh, means here, these two bottom lines. And then we add supersymmetry to these type of theories. So we want theories that are here supersymmetric because it gives us control uh, in, in these constructions. Very good. So in the context of these theories, what we're going to demand, so what are the conditions that we're going to impose? So we're trying to understand which of these theories could describe classical properties of gravity. Uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to impose, okay, of course we want these theories to have large central charge. Uh, here, uh, this is where I use supersymmetry. So without the aid of supersymmetry, this question gets way too difficult and I don't have anything interesting to report. But instead of asking, demanding the sparseness condition on everything, I'm going to demand uh, the sparseness condition on quantities that are protected. So I look at supersymmetric states and, and those are quantities that I, I, I will demand. And then here, there's another thing, um, the presence of this marginal operator, because what's happening in these constructions is the following. So the symmetric product orbifold description, you should think of it, again, remember that we had this weak and strong couplings in, in ADS CFT. This construction looks more like the weakly coupled CFT. Weakly coupled in the sense that the copies are not really talking to each other, okay? In that sense, it's weakly coupled. And so this will be a theory who it's dual. If you just grab the CFT, it's dual is going to be like a tensionless uh, string theory, okay? And, and that's not what I want. I want to describe GR. And so, uh, and so for that, I needed to make the theory strongly coupled. I needed to look at the space of strongly coupled uh, conformal field theories. And so what we do here with this third condition is that we look at basically turning on a deformation, a deformation that will make the copies talk to each other. This is what this marginal operator is doing. It will make the copies talk to each other. And then hopefully that will take us to a strongly coupled point, okay? So, so that's this third condition here. The third condition is something that tells me that I can deform this theory and, and hopefully find a, a, a uh, evidence of a strong coupling. Now, and, and, and here, these supersymmetric states are basically something that uh, they don't depend on this coupling that I turn on, which means that uh, if the supersymmetric, so the supersymmetric states should look similar at this point and at this point. And so if this point exists and it looks like gravity, then it should also be manifested at this point over here, okay? So that's why we added supersymmetry and, and we can do computations because we can look at these uh, states that are protected and find evidence of holographic CFTs. Bottom line, I will not give you the details on how I did this because it would take me like another three hours and you probably have heard enough of me. I'm getting close to my uh, cutoff here. I'm probably running out of time. Um, we nailed it. So I know the intersection between these two circles. So basically I know what are theories that meet uh, these conditions. And this is where the theory of modular forms and making use of supersymmetry in clever ways uh, came about. And not only, uh, so in, in understanding this intersection, uh, there's interesting constraints and conditions that we came about. Uh, you, one realizes that there's way more theories that do not live in the intersection, and it feels like looking for a, a needle and a haystack, those two that do lie in the intersection. But what is interesting is that still in this intersection, there's an infinite family of, of conformal field theories that meet these three criteria. Now, the important question here, uh, is basically, so here I'm making, so I'll, I'll present in this way. So what's very important here is that these conditions, and this is why I keep on repeating this word, I, are necessary conditions. But I don't know if they're sufficient to meet my engineering uh, requirements. So one, like what I'm describing here as next step, as this next technical steps are basically, would you have declared that you had sufficient conditions to claim that if you met these three conditions, you would be able to design a gravitational dual theory that meets these classical properties that you were asking? 
So this is one uh, an interesting question. But the thing that is nice is that we're at least able to systematically look within the space of conformal field theories and understand which of them meet uh, non-trivial conditions. And, and even imposing these conditions that you might have thought, oh, these are too weak, they're still quite stringent on the space uh, of conformal field theory. So I think with that, I am running a little bit over time. So I was going to show you what this infinite family is, but it's fine. So let me skip this. You can ask me what those theories were. But okay, my task uh, continues here. <laughs> we have lots to do, uh, as I hope I illustrated to you. I explain to you all of these things that I don't know and that I want to know and how we're making progress on knowing them. But this is my path. Okay, so. Um, we started at the bottom by talking about general relativity and black holes and how we got evidence uh, about the holographic principle. And I tried to give you an idea of what this holographic principle is in terms of a can of soup. And so I made you all hungry, but you already had lunch. For me, it's dinner time, so I am getting hungry. So it's bad to talk about soup. But in any case, uh, and the way that we're trying to implement this, this understanding, uh, the way I presented in the talk is by this low dimensional models that give me precision and control. So with that, these are all the arrows that I'm trying to interconnect here that I hope I made a convincing case. And with that, let me thank you. And I hope, um, yeah, this is how my day goes. I either live on the surface or I go into the bulk. So... I'll leave you with that beautiful image to illustrate how in, in holography we think about gravitational physics nowadays. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alejandra. And uh, for this very nice review of the recent ideas and application of holography. So we can ask, uh, well, first of all, let us thank Alejandra. So if you have an updated Zoom version, you can use reaction uh, features to uh, to express a gratitude and uh, okay let's pass to the questions and uh, please use the raise hand feature of zoom or write it in the chat or if you're following us on youtube you can also post a question on youtube chat so let me see maybe maybe i'll start with a question uh so about the last part right so you you, you talked about two directions that you were developing one is trying to make CFT looking like gravity. And the second was try to define what kind of CFT that may in principle look like gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, can, so in, in the second problem, can, can you relate the two parts and uh, in particular for super conformal field theories, can you, can you do the same trick as you did in case of non-conformal, like Ising and critical Ising? Ah, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, there's yeah so if you have a single cft right and you tell me even if the values are low for supersymmetric verasoro minimal models can you match them to be dual to a theory of gravity um i believe the answer is yeah so the difficulty comes in the following so when you have um so this it's because of a, a trick that we use for the case of the um, Verasoro um, minimal models, but is it, yeah, maybe there's something non trivial to say, but okay, let me tell you what the difficulty is. So, so when you don't have supersymmetry uh, and you impose the, the Veras, uh, and you look at Verasoro minimal models, just the ones without supersymmetry, the most minimal ones, the central charge is always less than one, right? But then also in that range, we have a complete classification of all unitary CFTs with a discrete spectrum. That means that like my space of conformal field theories is completely determined and I, and I don't have any um, ambiguity, like I'm not messing on anything. And so that, that's what gave us control for, for us to, I understand completely the universe of conformal field theories. Uh, and it means from the point of view of modular forms that you have a, a basis for the modular forms. So you know there's unique modular forms as a function of tau and tau bar for that value of the central charge. And then you're basically done. Like you know everything that is possible from the point of view of the CFT. That, that's what made, a, made this, this statement precise. 
Now, if you add supersymmetry, uh, supersymmetric theories will have central charge, uh, at least the 2,2 ones that I'm more familiar with, they will at least have central charge one or bigger. And, and the minimal model, you, you also have a classification of minimal models for 2,2, but the range goes between one and three. The problem there is that there is an ADE classification of Verasoro minimal models, but because the central charge is bigger than one, uh, I will also have other theories. And so from the point of view of like, what is the space of modular forms? It puts you in a little bit more iffy terrain because you could have non-supersymmetric theories contributing to that question. And you don't know what the classification of non-supersymmetric theories is. Now you could ask the question for a supersymmetric observable. And then you know that the classification is complete which is also something that we used for the symmetric product orbifold is that it, it's the fact, so we were using, so for a supersymmetric theory, you, you could ask this question if you only focus on the elliptic genera or in an index because Jacobi forms which control this, this index are basically classified. And, and that's how we get a lot of mileage in, in this question. But, but not for, you can't do it just for the partition function. That's what I want to say. If you, you could ask the question that you asked, for the elliptic genera. And I don't think someone has done it uh, as, far, as far as I know. We only looked at the, the Verasoro minimal models. I don't know what was said about the supersymmetric ones, but you would have to look at the elliptic genera, not at the, the partition function you will get. You can't determine basically. So I was okay, uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. I will have a question from Edison. Moreira, so please uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, thank you very much for, for the talking. Uh, as you said, you have the, a partition function in the book and you have a partition function in the, in the, in the boundary. I was wondering if, uh, how the temperatures in these two ensembles are related. Uh, they're basically the, so in gravity, the, the, in this case, is the, the, they're the same. So it's the periodicity of Euclidean time. But, but it's arbitrary or? Mm, well, arbitrary in the sense of. It's arbitrary or? Mm, well, arbitrary in the sense of uh, you're doing a, a computation on the canonical ensemble. So it's. Uh, but. Would at any point the Hawking temperature come about, uh, like four seasons? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So depending, so so for each temperature that you pick on the on the gravitational side, there will be a corresponding black hole, and so you will identify that. So the Hawking temperature you can also interpret it as a periodicity of the Euclidean time, and so if you fix a temperature, there will be a black hole whose mass will give you that temperature. Yes. <laughs> Yes, but, but that temperature come, would come with some uh, reason for the, the boundary side. Like, uh, for example, we know that the Hawking temperature is the only temperature that quantum fields can be in thermodynamic equilibrium with the black hole. That would be the same language that we would, would use in yeah. the boundary. Uh, it will be, in the, in the context of what I presented today, I was giving more, uh, when I view the, the gravitational computation, I'm taking more the, the Gibbons-Hawking point of view of how to think about Euclidean gravity. Right. So, so, that's a, so it's not so much a, um, in terms of like the original Hawking computation, in terms of like, oh, how does the black hole respond to quantum fields? But here the computation is the computation of like, let me evaluate the on-shell action, uh, the Einstein-Hilbert action on shell and Euclidean signature. And then the, temp the, the temperature corresponds to the, to basically this. So the, 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 the different way how you view Hawking's computation and Euclidean signature is that the, the black hole becomes a cigar geometry and the Hawking temperature is the periodicity that you need such that you don't get a conical similarity right. at the horizon. So th that, that's the... Right. Uh, that, that, that's how this it's the same it's the same interpretation that you would do in quantum field theory curved background exactly exactly 
exactly. Right. Uh, so, so, so that's that's the that's the interpretation. And then there's always for any temperature. Well, if you're above, so there is a phase transition in gravity, which also will happen in the in the CFT. Uh, but for any temperature that you pick, uh, uh, when and high temperatures, there's going to be a corresponding black hole and. And and then the map will work, and so and then it, it it's very similar. Then the, the ways variables are related, from the point of view of the conformal field theory, is uh, you can also derive this, those same relationships in the thermodynamic regime of the um, of the conformal field theory. So this goes under the name of like the Cauchy regime mm -hmm. of the of the conformal field theory. So and it, and it beautifully like you see how the things that you do in gravity and the things that you do in the CFT. They, they match like it's very uh, impressive but yeah, it, yeah it will work. just a, a short one uh regarding the the, the paradox the, the information paradox in black hole physics can this approach of engineering holography as uh, give any clue of uh, so uh, solve the problem well, yeah, so there's, it's just that there will be then different problems. One of the ways I think it's more instructive to, because the information part, paradox, there has been progress in understanding it. Um, but I think um, part of also understanding that, so my, my perspective and from this engineering point of view is that part of understanding the resolution also implies understanding which from the low energy point of view, so at low energies, we have gravity coupled to matter or because well, matter exists, but in any case. So, but I don't, my perspective is that I don't think that any low energy effective field theory that you can write will have a UV completion, a, a quantum uh, completion. And so I think if we understand better, what are theories of gravity that can be UV completed it will give an understanding of like why those additional degrees of freedom might have been important to resolve the information paradox. That's one perspective. Mm -hmm. Another perspective, uh, and it's also based on one of the open questions that I asked, is uh, just understanding the dictionary better. So uh, in, this, in this point of view of like, oh, what does it mean to go into a black hole? What does it mean to reconstruct the geometry behind the horizon from the point of view of a CFT? This is something that like, like yeah, you have to come up like, what is the observable in the CFT? What is the question that I need to ask the CFT such that I can explore that part of the geometry? And so that's why it's also a bit engineering from the point of view of like, what are the tools that I need mm -hmm. such that, this process that in gravity seems like obvious that you can jump into a black hole makes sense from the point of view of the boundary. Right. And there's some proposals on how to do that, uh, but I think there hasn't been consensus. And in and, and, and part is also because the CFT is a strong coupling. So, so when you make proposals, you have to be careful, like how well do you understand the CFT? And so it's a, it's a challenging question. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Edson. Uh, I, I maybe just briefly add, but um, this is, was my understanding of the question as well. So I think this recent progress, uh, although as Alejandra said, there's no consensus, I think it is very much based on this uh, kind of engineering or in general holographic intuition. So it was like major inspiration, although not, not necessarily the only way to, to resolve the, pro the paradox. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think uh, Tiago has an, another question. Please, Tiago. Yes, uh, thanks a lot for, for the talk. Uh, uh, you mentioned this averaging over CFTs, that that is some debate. Uh, could you yeah. comment more about it? I don't know. Well, it's just that um, people say things and yeah, well, the, the problem, okay, so, um, Okay, so when you have pure gravity, uh, if you only have gravitational degrees of freedom, uh, there's a puzzle. Uh, and the puzzle is that um, you have in, in ADS3 gravity, and, and in that case, it's, very, it's a very explicit puzzle. So you can have geometries that have uh, two boundaries that are the boundaries themselves 
uh, are disconnected, but you can connect them as solutions to Einstein's equations through a wormhole. Okay, so they're two, they're geometries that have two asymptotic boundaries, but they're connected uh, through a wormhole. Now, if you, from the point of view of the CFT, if you computed the partition function of two, of two copies of the CFT, you should have an answer that factorizes, but in gravity, when you do the computation of what is the path integral of that configuration, because you have geometry in the middle, it doesn't factorize. And so it tells you there's a factorization problem. Now, people suspect, based on uh, examples that happen in ADS2, some uh, other weaker evidence that there should be an app, that the reason why the answer doesn't factorize, it's because there's averaging over this space of CFTs. But it's a very frustrating discussion because it's not clear what you're averaging over and, and what are the rules and if you need only unitary theories or do you need non-unitary theories and, and uh, in which sense this addresses something like or not because the, the cases where they're capable of computing some averaging are very limited. So that's why I'm like, that's not consistent. But then there's also another um, line of thought that thinks that this averaging, sorry, that thinks that this factorization problem can actually be understood as some eigenstate thermalization type prescription. That maybe it's it's not um, it's not due to averaging, but it's due to some prescription in how you create thermal states in the CFT, and, and, and there might be a way how to argue for, for this type of distributions and this type of behavior if you ask the, like if you define correctly what the observable is in the CFT itself. So then you might have thought that naively you should have been computing the partition function of a CFT with two different copies, but maybe instead of averaging that it meant that you had to give a different prescription about how the, the two different boundaries were connected. So th those are, that's another perspective. It's not as popular, but it is another uh, possibility. I think all of this for me indicates that, because I, I think that if you, I think in, if you have like a theory of gravity that comes from a string theory that has a UV completion, I think you're not going to have a factorization problem that all these geometries will have counterpart contributions that cancel each other and things will work beautifully. And so it just tells you, this will be for me another indication that not any low energy theory of gravity has an actual CFT bill, meaning that it's not a UV complete uh, theory. I don't know, did that, I hope. Yeah, yeah, yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, Alejandro. I do not see other questions. Tiago, please confirm that there's none on YouTube. I'll, pro I'll probably add a comment that you mentioned that people do an ads CFT correspondence can be identified by talking about bulk and boundary, that you probably also know that uh, somehow uh, people that discussed quantum hall effect, right, that they already had uh, bulk and I mean, even this terminology, I think bulk boundary correspondence was used uh, probably some years before ideas safety correspondence. Oh, but I thought it was more the edge or not that boundary. Uh, well, uh, okay, maybe edge, but I think I think it is really, I mean, in certain versions, it should be bulk and boundary. Uh, okay. But okay. I, I thought they would talk more about the edge modes and the bulk modes, but. Uh... Okay. That, that's that's uh, yeah. Well, okay, so then there's an ambiguity. Would... Be careful that you might. Uh... No, well, I think I think secretly they are, they're the same people in uh, many cases, but uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, not all of them. Okay, uh, so thank you very much again, Alejandro, for a very nice talk and uh, for being here today with us. And uh, I invite everyone to continue uh, next week with more seminars. Okay. Very good. Thank you again for the invitation. And I guess I'll disconnect now. So it was nice seeing yeah. you guys. And I hope all is well. Thank you. Same here. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.